don't even know the amount of food I was eating. I just know the number of grams of protein I was eating per day. How many? 380. Are you serious? On this episode of Let's Get Real, we are talking to Jackson Vanderworken. He is the actor who played the role of Nephi in the Book of Mormon series that is a month and a half to prepare for this. I gotta be large in stature. I'm not that large. I wanted to get to that level, but I felt like there was this huge gap between me and them. I was really concerned about physically measuring up to the role. 380? Like, how many chickens is that? The stress finally got to me, and I just was like, hold on, I need to, like, take a step back here and focus on the spiritual preparation. Elder Christopherson gave you a blessing that you'd be able to feel what they felt. How would you describe how you felt in that moment? Gratitude is the biggest piece that our world is losing track of. You know, playing Nephi was a huge catalyst to everything that I've done so far. Yeah. And I knew that at the time when I was auditioning for the role, I was like... If I get this role, this will be amazing for me. But now that I, you know, that's that's happened, it has been more amazing than I could have imagined. Yeah. But on top of that, it's not really the right frame of mind to have. Is like it was a little selfish for me to be like, oh, this is so good for me. You know? So whenever you found out, that's kind of the thoughts you had. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I hadn't even found out. I was like, man, just the fact that I have the opportunity to, mm. to even audition for this is amazing to me because I had like very limited acting experience and everything. But my my answer is pretty short. I'm like, yeah, it was a really great experience. Like, oh, how'd you how'd you get it? And I'll be like, luck. Yeah. I'm like, oh, really? Like, yeah, I don't have any acting experience. They told me my acting sucked. And <laughs> so wait, <laughs> they told you. So for what I, what I understand, like over a thousand people auditioned for this role. Yeah. You get. Uh, I, I remember. I, I you were saying that you your dad was like. What are you doing? Like you came in your room and you're like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> yeah. And you're like, "Uh, nothing." And he's like, "Don't worry about that." What did he tell you? <laughs> he's like, "I don't want to pay for you to go out to Utah and get paid two dollars an hour to be an extra in the Book of Mormon videos." I was like, "You're right, Dad." Yeah. So then your mom <laughs> comes back and she's like, "Hey, uh, what are you talking about? Send that in, right?" <laughs> yeah. So you send it in. I send it in. And then a month later, I get called back. They say, oh, you got a call back for Nephi. And I've gotten called backs before for yeah, like theater yeah. stuff. And it's been like 50 people. And then you yeah. go in, you'd like do the whole audition process again. And they pick who they like. Yeah. But this, they were like, no, you're one of three people that we've chosen. But they were like, what they tell you? You said that they said. Your acting needs some work and you're too skinny. So let's dissect this for a minute. <laughs> All right. You're too skinny and your acting needs some work. Yep. Like, honestly, what did you think? Like, oh, you like me. It's one out of a thousand or so, but what's up? Well, they told me. So originally the casting call said you have to be 18 years old, 18 years old or older. You have to be muscular. You have to be over six feet tall and have acting experience. And I had like some acting experience with community theater. I was six feet tall, so I wasn't over six feet tall. I was 16, so I didn't even meet the age threshold. And I was like super skinny. How much did you weigh at the time? 165 pounds. So they wanted you to be what? 200? I don't know. They didn't have. A, they didn't even have a plan. They're they just like muscular. More. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically what they did. Bigger. Bigger. You're like, okay. Uh, okay. So they think that you your acting needs work. <laughs> yeah. And that, like psychologically, did that affect you or did not? Well, no, because I didn't really try in the audition, to be honest. Really? Because I didn't think I was going to get it. My mom was like, just do it. And my dad and my cousin were going to go out for like a golf outing or something. I was like, oh, I want to go with them. I want to go with them. She's like, okay, but let's do this really quick. So like, I barely memorized the side. Like, what was it? It was like a scripture in First Nephi. Okay. Nephi, I think it's the one where he's like, it's actually the first scene we shot, to be honest. Really? It was the one where after they saw the angel, oh. Nephi is convincing them to go back to Jerusalem. And he's talking about how the how Moses and the Red Sea and the divided and yeah, all that yeah, kind of yeah. Stuff. Like so, you don't believe that that God can do it. I mean, come on. Yeah. He's like, he's like, yeah. Their faith, like, trying to increase their faith. Yeah, it was a horrible audition. Like, <laughs> what was it? like how? What was it like? I was, like, so I was looking. I, Nephi, I was looking at the camera, to did. and I was like trying to remember what the words were to the script, and I was reciting them like this trying to act like I was thinking, but I was just trying to remember the words. Really? Yeah. Do you have the tape? I I had to have to look for you it. You had to look for it? That's funny. I think my yeah. mom's got it on her camera, but yeah, it's not good. And so I sent that in and I was like, all right, it's over and done. And the casting director told me, she was like, 
you know, she had over a thousand people she had to look through for Nephi. Wow. And she got to the point where she'd like listen to the first line and just like flip through it, you know, because you can tell if someone's got acting experience. Yeah. Just by the first line. Yeah. She's about to flip through mine and then she said like the spirit stopped her. Really? She's like, you're going to want to include this kid in this project somehow. That's all it said. Maybe not necessarily that role. No. And I believe, obviously, because I met my wife on set, mm. that obviously I needed to be included to meet her. And But it didn't say anything about Nephi at the time. But the thing that they liked about me was that I was young. I found out later that they also just like this part of my face. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we want him for this. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. And I looked young because they wanted me, you know, they wanted to do, the youth to be able to relate with Nephi. Because yeah. I found out later that Nephi was 15 years old when he slayed Laban and left Jerusalem. That's crazy. Yeah. So I was seven, I was 16 at the time. I was 17 when we started filming. So I was like right in that age range, age range for that. Because a lot of times, even in most, in a lot of movies, the people are playing younger parts and they're older. Right. But there's definitely an, uh, an innocence naturally just being that age. Yes. And then that's what they thought because the other guys that were auditioning were in their mid to late twenties. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so they're like, we need this kid. And you feel like you're saying from my understanding is you think that it was definitely a divine kind of intervention thing is what I'm getting. Oh yeah, definitely. And one of the main reasons was so you could meet your wife. Yeah. I'm, I'm we're convinced that, you know, that's one of the biggest reasons. Cause outside of that, like what's more important than family, you know? Yeah, of course. You know? So th think about how intricate that is though. And I'm noticing a trend on a lot of these interviews. It's like you see these very intricate, delicate, like very hand-picked experiences, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you get the role and now you're at the point where you're like, okay, <coughs> you got to gain some weight and you go and you like work out all the time mm -hmm. and you're preparing physically. Eating too much food. Eating yeah. too much food. How much food are you talking? I don't even know the amount of food I was eating. I just know the number of like grams of protein I was eating per day. How many? 380. Are you serious? 380? Yeah. Like, how many chickens is that? So a chicken breast has 20 grams. 20 grams. So just one chicken breast, 20, I don't do math. Hold up, 30, how many? 300 and what? 380? 380. So wow. Most of that was protein shakes. So, so protein I shakes? I was like, whey protein, four times a day, two scoops, 50 grams a shot, and then I was having three meals, or four meals outside of that. Wow. So then you, so do you gain weight or no? Yeah. I did. How much did you gain? Gained 15 pounds of muscle in like a month and a half. Are you in a month and a half? Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. Are you serious? I'm serious. A month and a half? A month and a half. 15 pounds of muscle? Yes. It was lean? Lean muscle. That's amazing. Yeah, it was It was a miracle. Like, I, <laughs> I'd never, I never expected it because I tried to put muscle on myself. And You're like, like, no. Nothing. Like in high school trying to yeah. be like, hey girls, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, like, but- there were daily changes. Like we had this huge mirror in my house that I'd walk by every day and I'd be like, what? Why? I wasn't there yesterday. You know, like it was daily changes to my body where it was just like building so much muscle so fast. That's crazy. Yeah. So you need to take those secrets. I wasn't joking. taking roids. Like that wasn't the thing. Like so, I wasn't doing that. Well, so what was the secret? What, like, what do you think it was that allowed you to get big that fast? I think God was like, <laughs> really? Well, I mean, I was really concerned. So the biggest thing that happened was I was really concerned with like, Philip, you know, measuring up to Arnold Freeberg's paintings of Nephi being this massive dude and him, Nephi himself saying I'm large of stature. So he like, said that about himself. Yeah. So like, I'm trying to like, okay, well, now I got to be large in stature and I'm not that large, you know? So I was really concerned about physically measuring up to the role. Mm. And I put a lot of stress into it. So I had like a month and a half to prepare for this for the first half of month, that first half month yeah. that I was preparing in those 15 days, I was like honing in. I was really trying to get results and nothing was really happening. I was really? eating so much food. I 165. Was like, I was like, yeah, 165. I wasn't gaining anything. I was eating like, like my, my trainer would text me like, can you squeeze two burgers in today? I'm like on top of all of the food I'm So eating. you got a trainer. Yeah. That was like, eat this amount. Yeah. And the, they were my like, trainer was Amulek. The guy Are you, Amulek. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I was like training and, and nothing was happening and the stress finally got to me and I just was like, hold on. I need to like take a step back here and focus on the spiritual preparation 
Mm. Once I did that, I like immediately started seeing results. So what did you do? Like, what are some of the things you did to prepare, like, like detail specific, like to prepare spiritually? So I had, I had an acting trainer as well. Cause they told me my acting sucks. So I had to have <laughs> someone come and train me in acting. And, um, so on top of that, I also did a lot of spiritual preparation by reading first Nephi and just trying to like get to know Nephi and his relationship that he had with the Lord and try to replicate that myself. Mm. Before I got the role, I had a really hard time relating with people in the scriptures. Really? Yeah. I'd look at them like prophets are on this level. Like they're not. That's not me. They're not on my level. Like I'm way below them, you know, and I wanted to get to that level, but I felt like there's this huge gap between me and them. But learning about Nephi, I realized that Nephi's 15, like it's basically my age and he was called as a prophet at that age. Like, what's, what's the difference? Why can't I do it now? Mm. And so I, I made this like, like ooh, aha moment ooh, of like, man. oh, wow. Like mm. I don't have to be on a different level. Like they're, I can be just like them. Like there's no difference between Nephi and me, you know? So that's interesting. I mean, it makes me think of, is it uh, Second Nephi two sixteen? And I don't know how just random that I noticed, <laughs> but it's when he comes and he's like, "I believe that I can see what my father saw." Yep. And then it's almost like there's no, uh, there's no First Nephi three seven without First Nephi two sixteen. Yep. You know what I mean? And so for you in your own experience, you're saying that you believed that you could have this connection the way that Nephi had it. Yeah. And it became real to you. And one what, thing, one thing that I find interesting about that, like, the Lord doesn't choose like scholars yeah. in the scriptures. Yeah, He doesn't. And even like Joseph Smith was like a farm boy; he was illiterate, you know. And like all these young men in the scriptures, Samuel was just a boy. Like, he's not calling educated men. And that was the mentality I had as a kid: was like, oh, Lord's going to call educated men to like his prophets, you know? Yeah. That's the biggest thing that this world taught me is like prophets are not on a different level than us. Like mm. They're called of God, but they are not above anyone, you know? Mm. And that changed my perspective and, and on Christ too, my relationship with him. Like he's, yeah. he is the master. No one else is. Mm. Everyone else is just guiding each other to him, you know? Whoa, that's so important. He's not the master. We, we, you're saying that most people maybe look at the prophets like they're the master. Yeah. And you're saying that's not the case. No. You're saying Nephi wasn't the master. It was Jesus. Yeah. It, uh, uh, Lehi wasn't the master. It was Jesus. Yeah. Jo Joseph Smith, President Nelson, it's Jesus. Yeah. And I think the Lord was also teaching me a lesson too because and he was maturing my relationship with him because as a youth— I was really obsessed with like the coolness of the characters in the Book of Mormon, the stories that were told, right? Captain Moroni is like so cool. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And Nephi is so cool and Moroni buried the plates. Like they're all like really awesome dudes and I was inspired by them. And I think the Lord was teaching me that, yes, they you can be inspired by them, but they are not the goal. Mm. Being like Jesus is the goal, not being like Nephi is the goal. So I feel like he gave me that experience to be able to see that okay, now you know what it's like to be like Nephi and you can still be better. You know? That's So like, it's such an intimate experience to become in this role. You know, people have method acting, right? Yeah. And you know, you know, you can become like, you know, you know, people on set, sometimes they'll be like, I was on a set one time and this guy was like, yeah, I mean, he owned it. He owned it. He was like <laughs> looking at me like, I was like, okay, he's, he's okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah. But like, Okay, so let me, let me let me back up for a second because I want to ask this question in a second. You you then are taking your spirituality more seriously mm -hmm. and having that connection. Is there any any detail of specifics of what you would do specifically to get that that maturity beforehand and the preparation spiritually? Like in terms of prior to yeah the role? yeah like what did you were you reading were you like yeah I was I was reading and and performing with this acting coach to yeah really yeah. help me to realize because when you you could read. And you play out in your mind how it is. But when you're like, no, I am this person. Yeah. It is a different experience. Whoa. Tell me about that. You know, like when, like for the first time when, like in the video, you saw like, I yelled at Lehman and Lemuel. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know? Like you don't expect to do that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and 
really the most unexpected scene that I portrayed was the bursting of the bands. Like I did not expect to do anything that happened in that scene. I was hoping to be like really awesome and like burst the bands, but wait, no, the bands were loosed. So mm. like mm. can't be super awesome. And the way that scene rolled out was like totally unexpected. So like when when I was playing him, I saw it from how he would potentially see it. You know, you can't say like for sure, like this is what Yeah, this saw, is what you, you felt know? inspired from. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you get to like feel how he felt. Really? Yeah. And actually the coolest thing was um prior to starting, we had a little devotional with Elder Christofferson who came and gave an apostolic blessing to us to all of those in the cast and crew. Um, but specifically to the cast saying that we, who were portraying those characters would be able to feel the things they felt. That was the promise. Yeah. Wow. And you believe that? Yeah, I believe that. I'd heard stories of it before and happening on other shoots and I hoped it would happen and it did. So can you, can you detail that for me? Like what, yeah. so give me a, give me an idea of like, you know, you're, you're portraying Nephi, his brothers beat him up, tie him up. And now you're in this role and the cameras are in front of you. But in a moment, you're saying that in that moment, I, I'm assuming that that's the role you're talking about, right? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Which, but, which, is that the experience? Are you referring that to that one? Yeah, but it, but it wasn't even a moment too. Like, Interesting. Like there were moments where it was like, I felt how he felt. You know, and it was really strong. But also, I love the guys who played Lemon, Lemon and Lemuel. Oh. I love them. Whoa. You know? And Nephi loved his brothers. And, like, being able to see that from that perspective was really interesting. It takes the black and white out of it. Wow. Know? The black and white out of it. Yeah. Because usually mean? it can be like, well, Lemon and Lemuel, were, they were bad guys. Yeah, that's right. I see. You know? But when you like love the bad guys, you love your brothers. Like they're not bad. Like they're just making poor decisions. Oh, so interesting. You know, it, it, I, the, you know when you said that, it reminded me of, it, like a scene flashed in my mind of Jesus in front of Pilate, in front of all of his people, and they're sitting there and they're like, "Crucify him!" You know? Yeah. And it's like, and it, and it dawned on me just now that those were all people that he knew. And that he loved, that he knew. And it, it just gives me this different perspective of that it must have been what it was like when Jesus was on the cross, when Jesus was suffering from the the effects of us, you know? Yeah. The things that he that we do, that we just are human. And we always give Laman and Lemuel a, a bad thing, but you're saying from your perspective, portraying Nephi, you had this empathy for them, even though they're tying you up. Yeah. Wow. And, and it made me look at it also from like a more storytelling perspective too. Like Nephi is writing First Nephi as an old man. That's right. And so reading First Nephi, you can see like he's very black and white about Laman and Lemuel. He you is. Know? Like the wicked, the righteous, and that's how it is. Like, But he's had a whole life of experiences up until that point, you know? Yeah. What he was thinking in the moment versus what he was writing later could have that's potentially been different. Whoa. Tell me about that. That's so, this is so interesting, man. I'm telling you, this is really cool. Man. So like, the, you're saying the perspective of Nephi later, he's like, he's intentionally trying to get us to understand something. Yes. And at first it's just, oh, it's just black and white. It's just simple. Yeah. And you're saying now that he was, like, from your perspective laying there, it's like, there's way deeper than that. Yes. There's no way it was, it's as easy as it was written on the page, mm. you know? And that's why like, this is. That's why being able to even just watch it too, it brings a whole new dimension to the scriptures. You know, words on a page are words on a page until you start saying things out loud, mm. how they how they feel authentic. Mm. And it's like, you know, that might had a might have had a different meeting back in the day, you know, when he yeah. was saying it. So he's writing this down, you're portraying Nephi in the experience where Nephi is like, yeah, they tied me up. And you're saying Elder Christopherson gave you a blessing that you'd be able to feel what they felt. So how would you describe how you felt in that moment? Really sad. And it makes sense why he wouldn't fight back. Mm. So he didn't fight back. He's just sad. I can't believe this. They, why would they do this to me? You know, like Nephi also, like, mm. there's a degree of, there's a degree of like, when Nephi's large in stature, 
But if he's as large in stature as the paintings are, like he'd be able to smack Laman and Lemuel to the ground, you know, yeah. if he's that big. But Laman and Lemuel were pretty big guys too. But on top of that, Nephi probably could have held his own, but he didn't. He let them. I mean, I wouldn't say he let them. He's also well, a kid, you know? Yeah, yeah. They also were two versus one. But at the same time, he didn't go after them after the fact. Mm, mm. You no, know, he didn't retaliate. He he was just sad, you know. Mm. So that that was like the main experience of like tying up that I felt was just like you hit you hit a low when you feel betrayed, you know. And that's I feel like Nephi felt you know to a human degree how Jesus felt in the betrayal of his friends, except for they were, they were his brothers. So like what you said earlier, Nephi is a type of Christ in so many ways. Man, that hits me on so many levels, man. That's so, that's, that's I, I, like, I can't help but just, the love is what made it maybe feel so painful. Because mm-hmm. he loved it. The people that, these are the people I love. And he's tied up, they, they tied me up, like they don't. But it almost even expresses his meekness that he must have had. And then in comparison, even to the Savior himself, too, like he could have overpowered them. And like, yeah. you know, when, when they come and they, they tie up Jesus, literally, they tie him up and they take him uh, when, and then, you know, Peter's over there, like he cuts off the guy's ear, right? And then he willingly, and I, I know you're not saying that Nephi willingly let him tie him up, but it's almost like the power came from the love, you know? Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. I'm learning right now, man. This is powerful, yeah. honestly. Another thing, too, that I really learned is the perspective of Laman and Lemuel. It matters to see that, too. Yeah. Because in the scene that I'm thinking of where they time up and throw him in the wilderness to rot, right? He, like, what I decided to do in that, when Nephi's trying to physically burst the bands, I did that scream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy who played Laman after the fact told me, he's like, Dude, that both Lehman and Lemuel actually said it. They were like, that scream made me want to turn back and go untie you. And I'm sure like Lehman and Lemuel might have felt that, but they just, they, mm. it's like a, there's a conflict of emotions in people constantly. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And you only read in the Book of Mormon what they do, mm. but you don't read about what they're thinking. So as they're walking away, leaving him in the wilderness to perish, Nephi's trying to escape. He's probably screaming and they're just like fighting the urge to go back and be repentant until the bands are loosed. And you can see the way Layman says the line, bind him again. It's almost regretful in a way, but he's just giving in to his anger. You know, it's like there's yeah, so much yeah, there yeah, that, yeah. that you don't see just by reading Layman and Lemuel bound him and they were angry with him. Mm. That's so- all you hear in the scriptures. So as an actor, you naturally have to kind of think about the backstory, how to portray it. And yeah. so that's got to be so interesting. And all of the different stories of how you had to think of, well, what was Nephi thinking? <laughs> what was Laman and Lemuel thinking? Because a lot of times we're more like Laman and Lemuel. Mm-hmm. You know, like they're like, they, they don't want to betray God. They don't want to betray the Savior. They don't want to betray the people who are, you know, trying to do the work of God. But we kind of get this pulled off to something else maybe, you know? That's what I'm learning right now. Yeah. That's so cool, man. But it's also like, it's such a fine line that you walk between mm. falling to the side of Laman and Lemuel and falling to the side of like being like Nephi. Nephi is writing again years later. He's painting a picture for us that is very black and white. You know, you never know like the exact, like he writes about what, eight years just yeah. in the desert. Yeah. So, like, there's so much going on in that eight years that Nephi wasn't perfect. Mm. He even talks about it in 2 Nephi 4. Yeah. He gets angry. Yeah. Yeah. He's struggling. The anger gets the best of him sometimes. So, like, I think he was just trying to paint the picture of, like, hey, if you give in too much, you become like my brothers Mm. who have fallen so far away that they've become murderers. Oh, my gosh. And then the other side is... Nephi, where you try to do what's right most of the time, and you say, yeah, sometimes we're like Laman and Lemuel, but also it's a fine line that we walk. I really don't think that 
there is, especially in like today's world, I feel like there's a lot of good that we overlook. Yeah. And I feel like there's a lot of this ambiguity that's just like people are trying to categorize into good or evil. Uh, that yeah, just is yeah, like, that yeah. doesn't even matter. Like what matters is what are you doing to try to be good mm. versus emotional versus angry versus all the, the core almost yeah. that's but and even the way that nephi responds to them it gives gives me more insight on how the savior would respond to us yeah knowing him him understanding and even the way you described it was so in, that was so intimate man like how how you felt in that moment for them how you really loved them uh, like aside from what they were doing to you you still loved them mm -hmm. and i feel like that's the way it is with with him like it's all, it's easy for us to put ourselves as oh those are the bad guys those are the good guys but all of us we have this desire to want to be good yeah and he sees that in us you know it's a matter of how you go about it and what really is good and what you're doing is like Lemon and Lemuel knew they weren't doing good in that moment yeah they gave in to basically the natural man at that point they did you know and so it's just a matter of like don't give in to that. How often do we give into that? And if I gave into it, I gave into anger. Mm. Let's so to Laman and Lemuel, they just do way more often. Mm. You know, and to the point they're past feeling. Yeah. That's that's powerful, man. There, there has to be so many little pieces like that. Anything else that you feel that you'd want to share that was insightful for you with that promise from Elder Christopherson? Okay, the boat scenes were really hard to film. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> like the, all the water. Yeah, but even just like if we were to talk about how the behind the scenes went, it's like really cool and epic and it sounds cool going through it. But at the same time, I just kept thinking about how Nephi did it for four days straight. Wow. You know? In real life. In real life. Not mm -hmm. knowing when he was gonna get taken off. Not knowing it was gonna be four days. Not knowing it was gonna be four days. He probably thought he was gonna die, you know? He already had his kids. Yeah. He saw the vision of his posterity, you know, like he didn't know what was going to happen. Mm. So like he probably thought he was going to die on that, on the ship. And he was, w what blows my mind is after he gets loosed, he thanks the Lord. Mm. And I've really tried to incorporate, it, incorporate that into my life, to be honest. Like there's been a theme in terms of, this whole idea of focusing on the spirituality and then I will get the temporal, temporal blessing. Yeah. Like even just recently, hmm. I was really trying to get a job and I was stressing. I had a financial situation. I was stressing and it wasn't until I hmm. took a step back, focused on my spiritual growth, tried to put my life in order because I'm a, I'm of the personality basically where I get stressed, I get overproductive in the area where I'm stressed. So I was really? like applying to jobs like crazy mm. and not being productive with it, you know, if that makes sense. Interesting. But I put my focus on the spiritual growth and I got a miraculous opportunity for a job at Purple. Hmm. So like it was more than I could have even asked for. I'm still a student in college and I have like the dream job that I could have asked for out of, coming out of college with what I'm studying. So like that being implemented throughout and, you know, the suffering I had before then it's hard to describe because, you know, like everyone kind of goes through that like financial stress and like they're looking for a job. But like when you're in that moment, it feels like, like, especially if you've got anxiety and you're like trying to think your way out of it, mm. you're like, oh man, if I, you know, don't get this job, then this happens, then this happens, and then I die, you know? Like, yeah, you yeah, yeah, like, basically, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like taking a step back from that situation and like once I, once I got this job, I can't help but just thank God profusely for delivering me from that pain, but also giving me this blessing. And so like I see the parallels there of like, once you are relieved from suffering, it's not like, oh, like finally, it's like, yeah. no, thank you. Like I couldn't have done that without you. So the, so the gratitude is a huge piece that you feel like you want in that scene, whenever he was grateful, whenever he was released uh, from that scene, whenever he was in the, in, on the boat, you're saying you like to emulate that in your life. Absolutely. And honestly, I think gratitude is the biggest piece that our 
world is losing track of. Oh. You know, we're so focused on good and evil right now that it's just like, there's no gratitude in anything. Whoa, what do you tell me more what you mean? I just, Where do you see it? In what way? With, like, it, it's it's a real, it's, it's an ingratitude towards people, you know? It's an ingratitude yeah. towards, like, past generations that the current generations are having with their parents and their grandparents. And yeah. it's just like, and the ingratitude that the parents have towards their children, you know, like, mm. like they don't, they don't seek to understand that and they don't, they're not grateful for them. Like how many times do you hear like parents complaining about how hard it is to take care of their kids? Yeah. You know, and like, how does that yeah. make your kid feel? And then their kid is so mm. ungrateful for their parents and everything their parents have done for them. Like, it's just that, that's kind of what I mean in terms of like the ingratitude is a huge piece of why things fall apart in my opinion. You know? It's a foundational piece. You know, I think it's, it, it's, it's really tied to humility. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, like you're going to get the job. Like, it's going to be you that gets the job, you know? Like, it's going to be Nephi. Like, Nephi's like, I am recognizing that I didn't do this, you know? Yep. And and when we keep on going on on our own, I mean, we're kind of left to ourselves, you know? And, and the Lord wants to re reward people who are grateful to him. He wants to, you know? How How much do you not want to give someone something that is just like, Oh yeah, I just like yeah, they yeah. Like are bragging about themselves all the time and how yeah. awesome they are, and I just you know I feel like the Lord is this, this is probably the same in terms of how He wants to bless people, you know. Yeah, or is it that He wants us to know? It's like it's almost like it's like I don't even. It's not selfish. He wants us to know where it comes from so that we can keep getting it. Yeah, you know. I, I don't think that he's like, I just want them to be set grateful. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. don't you know I bought that for you? Like, <laughs> you know, he's, you know, he's like, no, he's like, look, look, I want you to know where you can get it always, you know? Yes. Yeah. And, 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 it's, and it's really like a divine trait that you need to have in terms of progressing, like in terms of moving forward, in terms of seeing the bigger picture, to be like him, you need to be grateful, you know? He was grateful, wasn't he? Yeah. Always. Yeah. Like he like heals people and he's like, thank you. It's like he recognizes where it's coming from. Yeah. And so in you and your life, you're recognizing where these blessings are coming from. But at the same time, you always, you're like, you're noticing when you get, you kind of have the tendency to keep moving forward. And then there's always that moment where you're like, wait, wait a second, wait a second. <laughs> Let me focus on the true source. Yes. But then not just having it happen, but also being grateful for when it does. And, and it's so drastic. Like I don't even I don't even know how to convey. Like I started focusing on my spiritual growth, and it was like interview, 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 job. Like it was so fast. Isn't that crazy? It was so crazy. Yeah. What do you think that it is that how like like what's the core of it? I feel like it's just it's it's real it's realizing because I had realized throughout it, I was like I gotta focus on my spirituality. I gotta focus on my spirituality, but. Aside from realizing it's a true commitment to it, you know? That's interesting. Just what you just said. Because you could go through the motions of it. Mm -hmm. You could you could fake like you want to focus on the spiritual. But you're saying the true commitment of it. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Wow. So what does that look like? That's a great question. For me, it looks like intentional study. But it's hard to explain, like, I want to hear God when I read the scriptures. And it's different than just reading the scriptures. Mm. But on aside from reading the scriptures, like, that's the first thing I say. But at the same time, it's not the whole orchestra of things you need to do. It needs to be actionable things that you're doing. Like you need to be better throughout your whole day and be thinking of him and how he's blessing you. I don't know. It's, it, I feel like it's different for every people. For me, it just looks like a more, a more focus towards him mm. and those recognizing of the blessings. But in addition to that, just like, just trying to be a good, trying to be good. Really trying. Yes. Like I realized throughout this whole process of me slipping out of like a regular study and or just reading the scriptures to read the scriptures that I became more angry, that mm. I became more f irritated and frustrated, mm. you know, and taking a step back and realizing, okay, this is, 
because I'm not focused in the right place. When I started focusing in the right place, becoming angry was a more scarce, way more scarce thing, you know, and to the point where it's like I'm hardly irritated because you're you're kind of like in that realm of peace. Assurance is what I'm thinking of when you're saying it's almost like when Nephi was tied up, he saw the vision. He knew that he would be alive. Like maybe he would could doubt in the moment, but I feel like it gives assurance whenever it's real. Whenever it's like, I don't know, it's not the, the exact thing you're saying, but that's just kind of what, where my mind went to when you said that. It's like, do you really believe that he's going to catch you? Like he's going to help you get the job? Or do you really trust that? And I think that having a relationship with him, being intentional yes. in the real relationship where you're not just going through the motions, like you're reading the scriptures because you really want to read them. You really want to hear him, like you said. You know, I feel like that is what changes the game. Yeah. It's a true trust in the scripture where Jesus is like, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And everything else will be added upon you. <sighs> like that, that to me is when, when, when I really commit to knowing that, okay, when I seek God first, he'll help me get what I need. Yeah. And he wants to bless you. And he wants, yeah, absolutely. He doesn't want me to be overthinking things or becoming depressed because of my situation. He doesn't want that. But he wants me to turn to him for it, you know? That's powerful, man. Yeah. I have a friend that he um, he told me this story. It's kind of like this little parable of a girl who goes to the prom, right? And she goes to the prom. She gets dropped off at her house. And then as she gets dropped off, she notices there's this other car that pulls up. Long story short, she sees uh, the dad of this girl get out. The dad comes out and gives her some cash. And you, you he mentions that. And like everybody all of a sudden like, oh, she got paid to go to the prom with this guy. And so the guy sees her out the window getting paid to go on this date, you know? And so it's almost like by her dad, like, oh, go on this date with this guy. He never, you know, um, or or you could say vice versa. Like the girl goes on, the, the guy goes on the date with a girl, right? And it's like, God wants us to want to be with him. Yep. He wants us. And it feels like when that really happens in the reality of what it is, that's when, that's whenever I, power comes. I think you hit it right in the head. Yeah. You have to want it, not because of the blessing. And that is when things start to change. Then you'll get the blessing, you know? And that's what I realized is like, you know what? I got to stop just begging him for the job. I have to like know he'll take care of me. And that was the attitude switch that I had. And he took care of me. Yeah. And he will always. At the very beginning of the Book of Mormon, my tender mercies are upon all those who put their trust in me. Yep. Basically. I'm paraphrasing, right? That's it. Yeah. What tender mercies have you seen? What tender what tender mercies have you seen? You said you met your wife. Anything else? Oh, there's a lot. I mean, there were tender mercies all throughout the the filming of the the videos from the weather. You know, you always hear the weather stories. Yeah, it stopped for two hours and he, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it really did. It really did. Like, fog disappeared, you know, rain stopped, held off right when we left, poured. Yeah. It was, you know, those those are, you know, tender mercies where they're like very small blessings but make a huge difference to the outcome of what we were trying to make, you know. Yeah. So there were times when it was like, oh— we need to get this shot. And was there any opposition? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, there was. But even so, um, you know, people who haven't been on a Hollywood set before, I haven't. But those who have, I've heard it's a really intense environment. Really? And we had a lot of Hollywood people working on the crew mm. for the Book of Mormon videos. And they were like, this is the best show to work on. Really? There's none of that. I mean, they say none of that to the degree that it is in Hollywood. Really? But at the same time, there was opposition, you know. Any that you feel comfortable sharing? That's not, you know, don't we'll throw anybody on the bus? So we can talk, I guess, about like spiritual opposition 
this was more from the perspective of others that I didn't see mm. based on what others told me. So the day that we did Bursting the Bands, most people will tell you, at least in First Nephi, that was probably one of the most spiritual days on set. Really? Don't know why that day, but it was. And there was a shift in the feeling on set when the bands were loosed. Mm. It felt like a really great parallel to the atonement and how that functions, being bound, mm. begging for deliverance, and then receiving it. Wow. And so outside of that, people had their own personal experiences, but the one I'm thinking of, someone who wasn't on set that day had a dream and it was of like, basically almost like a spiritual looking dome over the place where we were, we were filming. Mm. And it, like darkness was surrounding it, trying to get in. Really? But unable. And it just, you know, the way I imagined that when they were telling it, it was kind of like the darkness versus light. There's so many examples of that in media and in like movies the one i'm thinking of is like where gandalf and the hobbit is like rejecting like sauron with his <laughs> yeah. staff you know but like there is opposition that we don't see even Ooh. Mm. and i didn't even realize that that was going on but the lord protects us from it because he loves us and because we're doing his will and so you know being able to see from the outside like how much Satan tries to thwart God's work. Mm. He's he's unable. Yeah. So there were some things that were happening. That's a, that's a powerful story too. I mean, just they, they had a dream that somebody was gonna like that. There was like almost like you, you felt like that dream was representative of the opposition that you're yeah. saying. Yeah, you can always look for the physical, but the spiritual is always there. And, and just to be clear, this person was not on, had never been on set, didn't know where we were filming. Mm. Um but described it perfectly. Like, don't know why that person had the dream, but I heard it through one of the other actors. It was um, Ishmael's wife who who knew the person. But yeah, really, really cool um, things like that that happened on set hmm. where you saw God's hand fighting against the opposition. And that's insightful for, I think everybody to consider that it makes me think of uh, President Nelson's uh, last talk where he said, and he said this multiple times, he said, from between now and when the Lord comes again, he'll, God will perform some of his mightiest miracles between, is it between now and when he comes again, right? And it's like, like it's the spiritual stuff. A lot of it, I feel like we want to see, like obviously he says you'll see God perform, right? It's like, but a lot of them are, will be, like the spiritual stuff, man. You know, like he's protecting us. Like he's, he's he's making all these changes happen, like on a spiritual level. That you can't the stuff you can't see. Yeah. You know. Um. Well, cool. So you you play the role. You have these amazing experiences. Any other experiences that that um that you feel the need to clarify or to to uh to share that could be helpful to anyone else out there? Uh. Yeah. Slaying Laban. Okay. <laughs> so everyone always is like, if Nephi had, you know, cut the head off of Laban, you know, there'd be blood all over the clothes and da 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 <laughs> And I just want to clarify the thought of the director who directed the scene. You know, they, they thought through, you know, how it could potentially go. That's why they put them, put Laban on the staircase. Mm. So like the idea is like, the blood would flow down mm. instead of onto the clothes. Mm. But yeah, that's like just a funny tidbit that we, you know. Really? Yeah, there are a lot of fun facts like that. that that's why they filmed it that way. Interesting. You know, um, you'll notice that like I didn't make that Laban voice when I dressed up as Laban. Yeah, you didn't. No, yeah. like they were thinking, okay, well, for it to really deceive Zorm, Zorm's not stupid. Maybe yeah. Maybe God performed a miracle. Yeah, you know, yeah. And changed his voice. So like that's what they were thinking Performing that scene. Like it was more in his head. Could have been, yeah. Is that what you're saying? 
<clears throat> yeah, like the scholars were were thinking of portraying it in a way that just felt more like the Lord was playing a part in the disguising of his voice. Mm, instead of like this magic. Rather than Nephi me, me trying to be like, Ron, give me the play. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 I see. <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> just imagine like, like hey man can I get a plate there <laughs> yeah. Yeah. who was that oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's not yeah um, but other like I guess fun facts too like I learned through the art director that steel bow making is lost art really yeah so it was something they did so that's actually some sometimes what people say to kind of like refute the truthfulness of the uh, dispute the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon by saying, oh, like steel bows aren't a thing. Mm -hmm. But um, some things I learned about it is like you had to heat the steel to the perfect degree mm -hmm. for it to work. But even then, over time, you know, if it was heated a little too much or if it was heated a little too much, over time, the bow would become brittle and break. Really? And if you didn't heat it enough over time, the bow would become loose and lose its spring, which kind of explains why Nephi's bow snapped mm. and Laman and Lemuel's bows lost their spring. Mm. Nephi wasn't just like pulling his bow too hard. And then, and we kind of overlooked the fact that Laman and Lemuel's bows lost their spring, but they all had these steel bows because their dad was like a merchant and he mm. would go and trade for them. So like, yeah, fun facts like that. Learned Interesting. All wait, wait. That. So Nephi... So what were you saying was the insight from that one with Laman and Lemuel versus Nephi? Well, Nephi wasn't like – so the idea is like Laman and Lemuel, there's not – I don't know if there's any symbolic thread well, to it, but um, just that we all look at Nephi as like being the super jacked guy who can break bows by pulling it yeah, back yeah, so yeah, hard. Yeah. You know, it's just like – actually, it's just the science of, I guess, steel bow work and – Oh. You know, like it just snapped over time because it was used so much, you know, instead mm. of it just like – why did you draw so hard? Well, theirs his was, co his well, theirs was cold and his was warm. You yeah. got me? Like, yeah. theirs lost the spring because they, maybe they didn't use it enough. I don't yeah. know. I, yeah. and his was his was broken, which would meant that it was exposed to more heat, right? Is according to that? Well, yeah. When you make the bow, you'll heat it up to whatever degree. But if you if you don't hit it right, and over time it will lose its spring or it will snap. Oh, it's both just, ways. It's just, okay. Yeah. It, it just depends on how it was made. It's Interesting. Learned, yeah. Mm. And it must have been, and also it must have just been really hot where yeah. they were, you know? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. What else? Anything else? Oh, man, not that I can think Let's of. Let's go here. I'm trying to get anything, you know? <laughs> um, okay. So you had this amazing experience. And one of the things that, um, that you kind of touched on, but I'm curious, you feel like God, you, you met your wife in this experience. You feel like there's a reason why you played Nephi more than just so you could have this really cool role to play. Mm -hmm. What would you say for you is, what, what do you think God wanted you to know about him, about his son, playing this character who is, from according to what we were saying before, a type of Christ? Um, I would say, like I said before, the biggest thing is that he is the most important. I think I had the mentality before that, you know, I looked up to men as... Mm -hmm. Almost my idols, right? We use the term idols. Yeah. But his point to me was to prove I am who you should want to be like, you know? Oh. So that that's probably the biggest thing that he wanted me to learn, but also that he chooses youth and he's always chosen the youth and didn't realize that before. And getting to know him through that experience. Cause I've had people tell me who were helping me get the role. They were like, listen, could have been anyone that played Nephi. Mm. I'm like, I don't think God gave me this role because it couldn't have been someone else. You know, I don't believe that. But at the same time, I learned a lot and things that I needed to learn outside of just like, Oh, that was so such a cool experience of, playing Nephi, although it was, I learned so much that, you know, like we've already talked about, but specifically about we can be inspired by men mm. and their experiences, but he's at the center of it all. Yeah. And 
the Lord will choose the uneducated the youth to carry out his work. He still does today, you know, through missionary work. That's beautiful. What, what, what would you say for you personally? What is the play, playing, knowing that Nephi is writing this years later and, you know, the word didactic comes to mind. Like he's intentionally wanting to teach us something about God. He's intentionally wanting to teach us something about the Savior. Yeah. What did you learn specifically about him in playing the role of Nephi? Um, if I were to look at it from that perspective, obviously I haven't arrived to the age that he was writing the scriptures, so I can't speak much for how he was thinking writing them. Because there's a lot of life I have to experience to even get to that level, I guess. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, but to me, it sounds like a very concerned parent for his his children, but the generations. Like we've talked about, he saw the vision of his whole posterity. Mm. And he wrote these records not just for – he probably wrote these records mainly for his posterity. Mm. And the Lord used it for us, you know. And – the Lord had a wiser purpose in writing it, but he also is like, you can tell he writes it in black and white, even though that's probably not how he experienced it just to teach us right from wrong. You yeah. Know? Clear. Like he, he wanted us to know that my brothers did not do what they should have done. Mm. They didn't behave as they should have behaved. And because of that, this is what happened. I don't want that to happen to you. And that's kind of the cry I hear through this, through the mm. scriptures that he wrote. That's powerful that he, in a merciful way, is calling to us to say clearly, look, look at the, look at the difference. Yep. I don't want this to happen to you. Yeah. And he's saying even to you and to me personally on a personal level, that's powerful, man. Yeah. Um, any advice you'd give young people, anybody who, uh, anything, anything, any, any form of advice? I would say the biggest thing to understand is that you do not know how the Lord is going to use you. Mm. And it might not be as big and as flashy as you think, but it will be more meaningful than you can ever imagine. Wow. That's powerful. We'll end on that. Uh, this is uh, Jackson Vanderworken. He played the role of Nephi, but he's way more than that. He's, uh, he's in the midst of his career getting it started, and he's going to be able to do a lot of amazing things. Uh, we know that uh, it really matters. God has something that's very special for all of us to do. He'll use you in ways that you never could imagine. Um, but he cares about the, the people who, uh, even the ones that hurt him, that's one of the main takeaways that I got from what you yes. said. I believe that everything that you said is true. And um, you don't have to just take our word for it. We invite you to find out for yourself. This is Let's Get Real. We'll see you next time. Gratitude is the biggest piece that our world is losing track of.